I'm going to play the way. I don't know what we're going to do with it, but I'm going to play it. It's very difficult. It's the most difficult poem this week. And for those of you who are nervous about things getting difficult, Josh, are you nervous? Things are going to get difficult. Would you and Katie swap? Let's get Joe up here. I mean, Josh. Um, for those who are nervous, you have a reason to be nervous if you don't get the way. The way is actually a lot like the poems we're going to be encountering after a while in this course. So here, Chris Martin, are we ready? Here is Ray Armand Trout performing The Way. The Way. Card in pew pocket announces, I am here. I made only one statement because of a bad winter. Greece is the word, Greece is the way. I am feeling real life emergencies or flubbing behind the scenes. As a child, I was abandoned in a story made of trees. Here's the small gasp of this clearing come upon again. And come upon, come upon and again are in quotes. All right, we're going to go around. We don't do this often because it takes a long time. But starting with Dave Poplar and then Erica, Max, Molly, Josh, Gabe, Davey, Joe, Emily, Jason. We're going to go around. And I want you to say any one thing about this poem. Anything, but it's got to be brief. Uh, something that people might have missed. Now, remember, we did a video about this poem, so it's not as if it's totally alien to people. So, Dave, can you say one thing about Ray Armentrout's The Way? Please? I love the line, flubbing behind the scenes. And I love that it's the only one that takes up a single line, makes it stand out. Cool. Erica Kaufman, Kaufman, Kaufman. I am feeling. Yeah, what do you think that's doing? Lots of amazing things. The line break before it really makes that line for me. Yeah, and she respects the line break in the performance. Mm -hmm. Grease is the word. Grease is the way. I am feeling. It's, so, it's almost comic, but yes, I am feeling. And this is a poem that's been said because it's so multivocal and so not subject, not her, that I am feeling becomes almost ironic because it's other people who are doing the I. Yes, great. Max? The small gasp. Uh, I love gasp as offset. And a small gasp is so much lovelier than a big gasp. Yeah. Yeah, big gasp is like, woo! -hoo! Like, my <laughs> earth, the earth is rumbling under my feet. Big revelation, but small gasp is, <gasps> right? Yeah, it's cool. All right, Mal, a thought? I'm thinking about Greece as a, a little snippet of collective childhood memory and the things that we associate with, with movies we see when we're young. Yeah, and I love that line from Greece. Greece is the word. I'm hearing, I'm not singing it, but I'm hearing it in my head. <laughs> yeah, there's a Sing memory. That's good, Mal. There's a memory there. Josh, hey, this is Josh. Right up to the mic, Josh. Hey, everybody. Um, I think uh, my attention goes to the word here. Um, we, have, we have this from Emily. We have now from Whitman. Uh, we're talking about Sid's space. And now we have here, um, perhaps Armin Trout's... Uh, geography, this, this space of the story that um, is perhaps the destination of if you take the way, you will be here. Perhaps here is the, the journey that you complete on the way. Um, she doesn't specify it, but you ha we have a new thing. <laughs> Josh, where the fuck did you come from? <laughs> Josh. Chicago, oh Illinois. God. That's so great. Yes. Here, here's the small gasp. Here it is. Here's where I get lost in the woods. And the f here's where I'm Hansel and Gretel. Here's where I learn how to read. Here, that's so cool. Gabe, top that. I wanted to point out just like the way Ray Armentrout reads, not to use the way in my answer, but, but you um, did. her manner of reading. It, like to me, a Ray Armentrout reading always sounds like at the end of it, she's gonna sort of like slap her knee and like, do a little like, because it's like, it sounds like a, almost like a dirty joke or like a little like euphemism that she's saying. So she's like, card in pew pocket announces I am here. Like it's, it sort of has this, um, 
I don't know if Ray's like going to love hearing that. But <laughs> that's no. fine. But no, that's I, think, fine. I mean, I think it's actually, certain... I think it seems very purposeful to me because yeah. it's not how she speaks. Um, yeah. And then what's good about that is like everything sounds euphemistic. Everything sounds like somebody else is saying it. So in the first half of this, you have these like quoted statements that are being um, framed in this way that maybe it sounds like they're being quoted. But then at the end, when it becomes a more personal narrative or something like that, um, it's still in that mode. So of this clearing come upon a Again, like it, it doesn't sound like there's this like very natural or melodramatic shift. She keeps yeah. this sort of like irony to the whole thing. That's good. Thank you, uh, Davy. I want to go back to, to what you were saying, Al, about being able to hear and not hear. Grease is the word in the way that it's borrowed, and um, those lines stand out to me. Grease is the word. Grease is the way I am feeling because they create a kind of counter musicality. And what I mean by that is, I feel like I have to actively push against the like onslaught of that music to be like, no, I'm asserting this poem against all of that noise mm. and that tension um, that all of the other noise that this excerpted language, this borrowed language could come with, being able to push against that creates sort of a beautiful tension that Ray's really reading into, that she creates a lot of space around her lines when she reads and thinking about the poem as something that's poised between different kinds of forces that like is a keystone within a, like a, a frame of sound is something that feels like it's doing a lot of work for me here. Wow, Davey. I am surrounded by smart people, and it is the best feeling. Joe? Just a small point. Um, I love Ray's work. I've, I've read it for years. I, I, it's, it's one of my favorite poets. But this poem might be relatively new to you, right? It's, uh, I I've, I've actually have used a, a bit of this as an epigraph uh, for, really? one, for one of my books. Yeah, huh. here's the small gasp of this clearing. But this poem is kind of rare for Ray in that it's not in sections, so... That, numbered sections. Like we were talking yeah. about the act of make the, the relationship between the poem and the reader and the creative act of, of reading. Mm -hmm. it's, that act is a bit different here because you have to take it all in one, in one shot where she usually breaks the poems down into bits, uh, increments. Mm -hmm. So it's an incremental experience and mm. it's a different way of reading different creatively. Way. Yeah, it's yes. a different way. Right. Fantastic. Emily? Yeah, I really love what Josh said about here referring to this particular poem. And I think that um, kind of uh, tilts the way we can read the, um, the final line of here's the small gasp of this clearing come upon again, that this poem itself offers a, a way for us to be found and be kind of eternally found and never be lost. Yeah, it has a really lovely connotation. Fantastic. Um, in res yeah, Jason's next and then Lil, and then we can go right to the phone call. Uh, in re the Twitter sphere is but bursting. Uh, uh, Colleen Knight, nice to hear Davy speaking about space, frame of sound, etc. Um, and Nicola Quinn, Nicola, our friend from Southwest uh, England, I believe, or Wales, I'm not sure. Sorry, Nicola. Um, uh, uh, puns. Here, here. Here, H E R E. Here, H E A R, the way. You're here, the way. Pretty cool. Okay, uh, Jason, your thought on the way? Yeah, I'm sorry, but I have two, and I'll be really quick. First is is to, oddly, this, this just occurred to me, is to think about this uh, fragmentary overhearing reminds me of flipping through the TV channels and making a poem of what I hear as I flip through, which reminds me of Frank O'Hara's moving through the city and having the random geography of the city be the thing that is the, that sequences the poem. The other is a fact that um, when I was seven, I was obsessed with the movie Grease for some reason. I remember being at a drive-in where in the rear, be out the rear window was Jaws and at the front window was Grease. I might have been Jaws too. Were you and dreaming that? No, my brother I mean, there was are, like there slamming are his head. drive-ins where they do back to back. Yeah, that that was in 1977 or nine, whenever when Greece came out. But what is important about this particular song that is quoted is that this was the disco song that was released in an, along with the movie, whereas all the other songs from the movie were doo-wop 1950s songs. So the movie itself is an act of nostalgia or of displacement in time or of quoting yes. time, whereas this song that's quoted was the, the, the disco release to, 
to coincide yes. with the film Good to point. catch yes. the current audience. Ray Armitrout is obsessed with layers of cultural archaeology. Um, later in this course in Mapo Plus, we have the poem about the Tennessee Waltz, which does exactly the same thing. Good point. Lily, quickly on the way, and then we'll take the phone call. Okay, well, um, I missed a little bit of what everyone said on the phone, but my, uh, my only thing to add here is more of a, a tone, an idea about tone. I think it's really important not to lose the darkness and the um, some of the sort of, like, terror or danger that's behind a lot of this poem. I think we tend to read the ending as very positive, and I want to push back on that by saying, for example, the story made of trees could be more of a Grimm's fairy tale forest where yeah. bad things happen to children who yeah. are abandoned. Um, yeah. The card in Pew Pocket could be in a, a gothic church, a very scary architectural space to and a child. And then there's the person who didn't um, speak for all winter. Right, and then Greece, you know, can be kind of a the danger there is in like actually a very scary vision of gender um, if you think about what happens at the end of that movie um, and there's actually an idea of emergencies so I think um, you know there's there's a positive reading of this poem and then there's a very dark um, undertone so I don't want to miss yeah. out on that in the when reading. When Ray Armitrat was here as a Writers House Fellow um, I think some of us pushed, not pushed, some of us speculated on the darker reading. And Ray hadn't thought of it that way, but she came around to it, I believe. Yeah. And that, the idea of, your, in, in particular, in her memory of her mother introducing her to the, the Grimm's, the scary Grimm's forest, Hansel Gretel following Crumb's mm -hmm. reading experience, getting lost, it was, it's a both a very positive thing, but a very sad and difficult thing for her, because then you've got a parent introducing you to the lostness of reading and losing yourself and it's and like an alternative to people being your parents right and a <laughs> very very gripping and real like memory that can continues for a lot of people into childhood of a fear of being abandoned just um like a physically as a child right. being abandoned not right. just a story um, yes and i think there's a whole 19th century tradition and this has been written about by ann douglas and others of women and girls in particular learning that the only place where they can get lost in a kind of liberating sense is in these giant books and novels right. that they were reading, the so-called uh, cult of sentimentality. Mm -hmm. And that was a, an escape for, for girls and women, and also a place to get lost and be separated from right. the hurly-burly commercial life that was reality of the United States. So